Hi, everyone. Sometimes it's easy to feel like it's a bit of a psychedelic wonderland out there, but we do also need to discuss the very serious side of psychedelic therapy. Misconduct has occurred and it is a very um, pertinent time to be discussing the issues of ethical framework and uh, how we go about training psychedelic assisted therapists. So today we will be hearing from Dr. Martin Williams, Dr. Simon Beck, Kayla Greenstein, Lily K. Ross, and David Nichols. We'll be covering how ethical frameworks are utilized in clinical settings and also with all of the interest that has been coming through, especially with the media, there is a huge amount of people who are now accessing um, DIY, self-treating or underground therapies and then how these issues are also playing out in that space. And there's so much that the underground as well as the clinical models could learn from each other at this point in time. So it will be a great conversation to have and I look forward to hearing from everyone. Start with uh, David, if you could uh, let us know a bit about yourself and uh, what you bring to the table. Sure. Um, my name is David Nichols, and I have been, I guess, unfortunately dealing with issues of misconduct and the related disclosures in psychedelic spaces for the majority of my time in psychedelic spaces. Uh, I used to be more of a underground researcher, drug nerd, weirdo, uh, and sort of in the in the context of presenting on some of those underground research findings and whatnot, found myself in uh, at, at festivals and conferences and in proximity with people who ultimately disclosed different types of harms that it experienced both in the underground and uh, above ground psychedelic contexts. And that sort of led to a whole lot of digging and learning about different folks in the field, both sort of present and historical, and uh, in some ways ultimately culminated in the Cover Story Power Trip podcast, which I created and produced and reported alongside Lily Ross, who's also here. And um, yeah, I I guess that's sort of the... <laughs> the the briefest summary of of who I am and what I can bring to the table for today's conversation. Thank you so much, David. Uh, uh, over to you, Simon. Yeah, hi, I'm Simon. I'm the Secretary for the Australian Psychedelic Society. Have been around in the Australian scene for a little while. Um, working with Patch as well. And um, yeah, I think all of these organisations have a real focus on the ethical aspects of psychedelic um, use and psychedelic administration, both in clinical and non-clinical settings. Um, clinical settings particularly pertinent to me as I'm doing my psychiatry training at the moment as well. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Uh, Martin Williams, uh, if you could give us a bit of a rundown. <laughs> uh, great to be here. Thanks very much. Um, Martin Williams, I'm currently a, post, a senior postdoctoral research fellow at Swinburne University in psychedelic um, research. And uh, my background goes a fair way further than that. So I'm a co-founder of, of EGA in uh, 2004, co-founder of PRISM and current executive director of PRISM. And so we... <clears throat> I've been involved, I guess, in psychedelics and the, in the psychedelic fields for uh, on quite a different, quite a number of different levels and, and different perspectives, uh, from the uh, from the harm reduction end to the medicalization and research end to the translation and clinical practice, and then of course now we're moving back towards harm reduction and perhaps away from clinical practice. So there are lots of different facets to explore, and um, yeah, looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, Lily, if you could introduce yourself, please. My name is Lily K. Ross, and I was involved uh, in creating and producing and reporting the Cover Story Power Trip podcast. And I um, started tussling with questions about power and authority in psychedelic spaces way back in 2009. Um, which was when I transitioned from using drugs in more recreational and private settings to starting to um, take 
things like ayahuasca in group settings, um, kind of right away, I was thrown by some of the behaviors that were normalized in those spaces even then and could see that ayahuasca was gaining a lot of popularity. And so um, that was sort of where my interest began. And then uh, I guess that curiosity took me down all kinds of roads, some darker than others, um, very much culminating in Cover Story Power Trip. Um, and these days I, I have no affiliations. Um, I'm an independent scholar and at times uh, with some frequency, just in touch with different kinds of people all over the world who've had different kinds of experiences and research settings and underground settings, um, learning about just some of the, um, the different contours and shapes of what harm looks like in these spaces um, and what some of the community responses have looked like and continue to look like. Um, thank you, Lily. Uh, Kayla, if you could uh, introduce yourself, thanks. Yeah, hi, I'm Kayla. Um, I grew up on Coast Salish land where I am right now. I'm very thankful to be here. And um, I guess my involvement and connection with psychedelics probably started from growing up and experiences uh, on Vancouver Island and uh, early university days at University of Victoria. But I I went into a path of studying economics and philosophy, then worked in Vietnam for the Vietnamese government for a couple of years and then ended up in Australia where I um, continued my studies in psychology and ended up working uh, in domestic violence and uh, sexual assault response services. So for the five years before I went into studying psychedelics as part of my PhD, uh, I was really focused on power and um, how power manifests itself. Uh, Lily and Dave's work with um, Power Trip was very in instrumental in, in uh, uh, kind of the early days of my PhD studies uh, were coincided with when that podcast came out. So um, I certainly uh, started connecting to some of those broader topics that I found really carried on from what I had experienced in my previous work and I saw coming into psychedelics. So I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney. Um, and I look at the use of touch uh, and ethical considerations in uh, as clinical psychedelic use. Uh, and I recently wrote about Ben Sessa, uh, which is why I'm here talking about it further. Uh, thank you so much, Kayla. Uh, yeah, and I'm Sienna Rose, or commonly called Pixie as well. Um, so... I am the president and founder of the Psychedelically Aware Talking Circle Hub. And um, our inception kind of came about uh, because there was some controversy in the media here in Australia. And so we wanted to think about what were the issues that might be going on in all contexts. Um, we probably focus a little bit more on the underground context in general, but as these uh, medical models are emerging, there is a lot to consider. And we think also that there's a lot that can be learned from the underground, but um, just heaps that can go in both directions, really. So, um, yeah, we decided to bring the community together, though, to have them have a part of the discussion as well, because really everyone should have a seat at the table. Um, yeah, so, um, oh, and I also study neuroscience. <laughs> Um, we're going to uh, actually start our first question with Kayla, uh, which is what uh, brought up the discussion today and, um, yeah, why we're here. If you could tell us a little bit about what happened with Dr. Ben Sessa. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll back up slightly and just clarify who Ben Sessa is. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with who he is, but uh, he is a psychiatrist, author, researcher. I got that info from ChatGPT, which I think indicates perhaps his level of uh, fame. He's, he's well known. Uh, so he... Uh, is somebody who was quite connected to the research in the UK that was really instrumental in starting the psychedelic renaissance, a term that I believe Ben Sessa uh, coined, but 
feel free to correct me on that. Um, he wrote an early uh, article uh, that referenced the psychedelic renaissance in a book in 2012 um, that kind of unpacked the therapeutic potentials and some of the uh, historic things. And uh, he is a co-founder of Breaking Convention um, and in the media a lot. I'd say he's somebody who had a, a large media presence and was in the Netflix documentary for Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. So um, to to frame I'll, I'll frame this in terms of how I found out about uh, what was happening with Ben Sessa in August of 2023, so less than a year ago. Um, I first saw a message from or, or a tweet from somebody who mentioned that um, people should keep an eye on the medical tribunals list, that there would be something coming uh, forward. So this was sort of the first kind of indication that something was happening, but uh, I, I didn't receive any other info until uh, February when uh, the public announcement from the M uh, UK Medical Tribunal uh, indicated that uh, SESA was being uh, was going forward with a hearing uh, for him having a uh, inappropriate or um, for, for misconduct. I, I somewhat stumble over the language because the tribunal has called this a relationship with a patient. And I think there's probably a, a lot to consider around the use of that language. And I will also add the caveat that all of the information we know about this case is uh, through the records of the medical tribunal, or at least all the public information uh, that we know and the medical tribunal that oversaw uh, the uh, the hearing uh, is not equivalent to a criminal court. So we only really hear the um, we're only hearing the side of Ben Sessa. Essentially, they don't have the powers to investigate like a police investigation and to um, pull out more information. So what we did, uh, what was established is that Sessa uh, had an intimate relationship, a romantic relationship with uh, a patient. Uh, he ended the relationship with the patient as a formal doctor-patient relationship, and then uh, very soon after had an intimate relationship. Um, the patient uh, and uh, known as patient A has uh, since died. They took their own life. Uh, and Sessa has um, agreed, or, or I shouldn't say agreed, uh, has uh, admitted to all of the allegations put forward by the tribunal. So that is not in dispute. Um, what the uh, concluded the tribunal was a finding that uh, his conduct was impaired and he was... Uh, given a 12 month suspension. And I, I think a lot of people had strong feelings about him receiving a 12 month suspension um, for, for uh, what had occurred. I think a lot of people, including myself felt this was uh, not an adequate, uh, uh, not an adequate response from the tribunal, um, but maybe that's something we can unpack further. So those are the kind of, um, bare bones structure of uh, what occurred. Uh, thank you, Kayla. Yeah, I do think that the um, 12 month outcome was something that was talked about a fair bit. And um, it is definitely something worth considering um, why different I guess, outcomes are obtained from these kinds of cases. Uh, but I'd like to uh, go to Lily and David um, on this one, uh, so whichever one of you would like to chime in first. But, uh, why is this international news? Um, are there other cases like this in the psychedelic community in recent history that you're aware of? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's a couple different ways to approach it. Um, it probably bears pointing out that there are cases, both recent and historical, that are uh, similar or that share similarities, certainly through the lens of looking at some of the power imbalances at play in these sorts of situations. Um, I think also uh, to the question of why is this international news sort of in the most 
uh, parochial sense or I don't know, like you could point out that Ben Sesso was in the UK has, you know, was then in Australia doing stuff for Mind Medicine Australia in the UK was, you know, as far as I know, and, you know, this is maybe the only uh, gripe I'd give with Kayla's Rendon. I don't think he coined the term psychedelic renaissance. I know he wrote a book, I think, uh, that that used it. I'm not 100 percent sure. I uh, not important ultimately, but I think to Kayla's point there, like it, it, it Ben Sessa was part of institutional psychedelia within the UK and not just sort of a fringe component of it, right? Like he was one of the the people who was in with the researchers at the forefront of media stories and articles, like scientific articles coming out of the UK. Um, he was an outspoken advocate of the, the benefits, supposed benefits of psychedelic therapy, of um, you know, psychedelic medicalization. I mean, you know, having having pulled up archived uh, tweets from his Twitter account, he was quite bullish on the promises of what psychedelic medicalization held in store for patients. And when you consider particularly the UK hub of people like Robin Carhart Harris, David Nutt, um, you know, uh, uh, folks who are at sort of certainly within psychedelic spaces and psychedelic research spaces, people who might be considered rock stars of this sort of field, uh, particularly, let's say, within a research context. Um, you know, Ben Sessa was somebody who was uh, there, who was part of that. And so the move, uh, I, I would say that alone would have made this internationally noteworthy. Um, the fact that that he moved to Australia to play a significant uh, role in Mind Medicine Australia's uh, Certificate for Psychedelic Assisted Therapy program, then sort of ratchets all of that up a notch. I would say it ratchets up even a further notch when you consider the fact that Ben Sessa was aware of many of the issues that that Mind Medicine Australia had been dealing with, some of which were were reported in Cover Story Power Trip, some of which were reported in a Four Corners uh, documentary, as well as uh, ABC write-ups. I mean, Ben Sessa decided to go and, and join that organization that had already been um, quite newsworthy and so like when you take all of those things together uh, i think in the broadest sense there's there's a, sort of a cascade of things um about his particular situation that makes this noteworthy thank you david Lily. yeah i just want to um chime in with a few a smattering of, of other thoughts you know this is the latest story in what's actually quite a long history of um, abuses of this kind within psychedelic spaces. Now, the how in whether or not this particular patient was in any way involved with psychedelics is not um, something that I've been able to figure out based on what's on the public record. Um, but Sessa is is obviously quite a prominent psychedelic character, and um, you know the one of the first publicly discussed cases of. Um, abuse in a medical setting involving psychedelics was in 1989 in the Boston area with Dr. Rick and Grossi, um, and carries right on through to today to um, some of the cases we covered in Cover Story Power Trip and things like that. Um, I also think that uh, it's interesting because from the dozens of victims that uh, Dave and I have spoken to, it's quite clear that there are patterns of behavior and common dynamics that seem to crop up again and again and again in these different kinds of cases and situations. And so I just want to really be clear to situate um, Ben Sessa in like a larger context in which a lot of these sorts of behaviors, unfortunately, are um, often enabled and swept under the rug when they do come, you know, become known in the broader community. I think one of the things that that sets 
Sessa apart in the broader context is that this is a rare case in which uh, the person who was in a position of power has admitted to a, a litany of allegations. And I think it's really interesting to consider um, what that means in this particular case. So we uh, we only get one side of the story. We don't know anything about what uh, the woman known as patient A, uh, how she would describe her interactions with Dr. Sessa, how she would uh, describe their relationship in retrospect at this time, how she might label that relationship in retrospect. Those are questions to which we don't get the answer because she is dead. Um, and I think that that is a very weighty reality hanging over this entire story. Um, I think, too, that there are ways in which, uh, you know, I, one of the things I worry about is having seen the way that things like restorative justice get talked about in psychedelic spaces, um, that uh, having somebody admit to these behaviors or admit to these allegations um, would lead to leniency both in like professional consequences and also leniency or a willingness to welcome that person back into the community. So restorative justice is being restorative of the perpetrator or the person who abused their power. And I just want to really make very clear in this case that restorative justice is very much about restoring communities and restoring victims. And there is no restoring patient A because patient A is dead. And there are ways in which the community cannot be restored um, in in that kind of, kind of spirit of restorative justice, um, because of that, and so I I just I wanted to be, I wanted to kind of put that at the fore of my comments um, because it's it's something that I'm thinking about a lot. Yeah, thank you, Lily. I think it is um, some very like they are really important points that you raise. We do only have one side of um, the interaction. And also I think it's important um, to highlight the, the need to respect the privacy of the family and um, patient A, um, that isn't something that should be dragged out into the media either. Um, so it is always a really tricky one to navigate because this is still being brought out into the public domain. Um, but yeah, I think having these conversations is incredibly important for that reason and also because there are people who cannot speak for themselves. So I'm wondering, Simon, in the general medical setting, how much of this uh, is a problem? Um, yeah, I think more than most people would like to uh, think is the case. Um, so in the year 2022 to 2023, ABC reported there were 841 reports of boundary violations um, by 730 registered health professionals in Australia. That's out of about 850,000 registered health professionals. So, you know, that's a relatively small proportion of reports. Um, in the 10 years from 2010, there's uh, almost 500 uh, registered practitioners who were sanctioned for sexual misconduct. And ABC says that about 160 of them are now practicing in 2023 still. Um, but because I like out of the number of registered practitioners, that's still, you know, 730 out of 850,000 seems relatively small, but that's just the number that have actually been reported. Um, Whereas some um, survey data has indicated that in New Zealand, about 3.8% of GPs um, reported having had sexual contact with a patient or former patient at one point. Uh, in the US, there's been estimates of between 3 and 12% of medical practitioners who have admitted sexual contact with patients. And in Australia, um, there's estimates of 7.6% of psychiatrists, um, mostly males, uh, who have admitted sexual contact with a patient or former patient. So that's, that's a really huge proportion. I mean, I don't think that generally speaking, the public would guess that 7.6% of psychiatrists would admit that they've had sexual contact with a patient or former patient. I find that really shocking, um, especially given how much of a focus there is in training on, um, you know, how unacceptable this is um, and how there is essentially never a circumstance that, you know, could be seen to where this would be justified um, or reasonable for, for really good reasons, which I think we'll, we'll get on to. Um, in disciplinary findings against Australian New Zealand medical practitioners, about 17% relate to sexual misconduct. Um, in the UK, that's about 9%. Um, and for Australian psychologists, uh, about 4% of all complaints made relate to sexual misconduct as well. So it, it, it is a big problem. 
Um, I think it happens more often than we would like to think in the general community. It happens more often than I would look, like to think about, um, you know, considering that these are, are colleagues, um, peers and trainers, people who are, you know, giving me education about ethics. Um, there are some, there's some research into sort of risk factors as well around, you know, what maybe uh, makes people more likely to fall into the group of people who perpetrate this sort of thing. Um, by and large, it does seem that males are far more likely to perpetrate this sort of misconduct um, and abuse. Uh, uh, working in psychotherapeutic settings, things seems to be a risk factor and I think that is because you are essentially forming a stable sense of attachment with the client um, you're talking about really personal stuff the the whole sort of premise of psychodynamic psychotherapy is based around forming a corrective emotional experience and some sort of secure attachment that makes people feel very um, safe and and you know feel like you actually have sort of a relationship and it's really important to maintain that, that the boundaries in that 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 is a, a relationship within a therapeutic dyad in that room that you know really shouldn't be generalized to outside that room with that that person or patient um, having uh, some psychological vulnerabilities being neurotic or narcissistic and going through life transitions yourself as a practitioner seem to be risk factors for um, perpetrating this sort of abuse and in terms of the victims by and large most are female um, and uh, particularly people who've experienced trauma which if you think about the people that are seeking psychotherapeutic treatment that is the majority um so that that you know that is obviously then going to be the highest risk sort of group um so i think yeah unfortunately more common than the public would like to think i think far more common than i would like to think and it goes to show that um even with all of the sort of general knowledge in the medical community that this sort of thing is unacceptable um it happens and it happens a lot more than it should um yeah and that some people are more more at risk of perpetrating that sort of abuse than others within the profession um i will say where i've said you know being being male is a is considered to be the most risk risky group for perpetrating that sort of abuse and being female is the most likely victim that is not always the case um and you know even reports of same-sex abuse do arise so it can happen across the board as well Thank you, Simon. Um, it is actually a little bit confronting to think about. Um, I knew it was rather prevalent, but that is still quite shocking to think about and concerning, which leads us on to Martin. Uh, why is misconduct such an issue? Well, why do we need these codes of conduct? And what is the current psychedelic assisted training uh, options at the moment? What is required and who can do them? So I think Simon's just encapsulated that whole situation from the from the medical perspective very, very well. And so I'm looking at this in sort of three three ways. I guess the first one follows directly from what Simon's been saying, that in the, the in the medical profession there are such clear and evident power imbalances that it sort of is um it's almost a given that that there is a risk, there's a potential for this conduct to take place. Um, certainly, of course, not to excuse it in any way, but I guess we can see how these sort of these situations unfold. Um, and I'd say we're, we're not we're not the first generation to be seeing this um, sort of take place over many, many, many years, um, where the medical profession has been held and in, in many cases rightly held in, in high esteem because um, we we place our we place our safety, our health, our good our, our good health in uh, in their hands. Um, and so I think misconduct from the medical perspective is quite well um, recognised, as Simon just mentioned, and, and so I think that is the foundation for where we're heading with psychedelic medicine and psychedelics more broadly. The second point, I guess, is that psychedelics are well known to, um, uh, in terms of engendering suggestibility in, in people who, who take psychedelics and have psychedelic experiences. And so um, people who are either um, in the middle of a psychedelic experience or in many cases have recently had one or, and are in need of um, a degree of integration are the most susceptible potentially to be predated, I guess we could say, um, uh, or subject to misconduct. And so that suggestibility uh, can tie in to a degree um, with, with personality traits such as narcissism, neuroticism, as Simon mentioned, um, and also the sort of the evangelical zeal that many of us can identify in people who are fairly fresh to psychedelics. And so all of these tend to lead towards a, a range of risk factors such as grandiosity and self-centeredness, narcissism and so on. 
And these, I think, are um, can be quite strongly and closely tied in with, with these questions of misconduct. The third point I thought I'd make here is that I guess this this seems particularly poignant at the moment because psychedelics are sort of um, they're the they're sort of the the topic du jour. They're the flavor of the month. They they're, they're on the verge of um, being destigmatized and legitimized to a to a significant degree. Um, and so, good press around psychedelics is something that a lot of people would clearly like to like to maintain and to ensure. Um, bad press is something that, that a lot of people would be, within the psychedelic field would be very concerned about because we're at a very, um, I guess we're at a very tender point, essentially, a very delicate point in the history of psychedelics. So it's once again the question of whether um, whether it's possible to see this through in terms of, as I said, destigmatization, legitimization. Or whether once again some bad apples, as we like to say, I'm sure it's not just bad apples, but uh, these bad apples will screw it up for, for everybody else. And so these are three sort of rather different sort of diverse points that I that I wanted to make, but I think they might be sort of good talking points to to move on towards. Um, as far as um, psychedelic assisted therapy training options are concerned, there are there's um, there's a fair history globally in in psychedelic training over the last ten to fifteen years, I guess, and this is coincided with the um, this sort of move towards medicalization and clinical uh, in, uh, translation, starting with clinical research, of course. And so most training previously had been within the institutions. But, of course, as things have really moved very quickly, then uh, training has become um, a, an option for many people working in the, generally in the therapy field, it can, can be um, medically trained people as well as allied health uh, professionals. And, um, and so there's a range in Australia, as you might be aware, uh, and other parts of the world. But in Australia, we have uh, the CPAP that was mentioned um, previously by David. That's, uh, that was, uh, it's essentially a for-profit arm of the charity organisation, Mind Medicine Australia. And uh, that sort of got the ball rolling, but of course, since then we've seen a significant uh, number, maybe half a dozen other training organisations. Um, by way of disclosure, I'm actually involved in as a shareholder in, a, in another organisation called Psychedelic Institute Australia, and uh, that organisation is also offering training now for, for, for therapists and potentially for authorised prescribers as well. Um, and so as far as the requirements to undertake the training, usually people would need to have a degree of therapeutic or psychotherapeutic background, although some uh, courses are more uh, accommodating of people who don't have direct sort of psychological therapies background. So some people, uh, some of the courses will accept social workers, nurses, nurse practitioners and, and um, paramedics and so on. Um, and then others are more stringent in terms of nece uh, necessitating things like clinical psychology background or and and in many cases a significant level of practical um, clinical experience as well and so as i say it's quite a broad sort of spectrum in terms of the requirements who can do it i guess i've just mentioned who, who can do it uh, relatively speaking there are um, there are few courses that, that will just simply take people in off the street, but then in, in some cases those organisations are endeavouring to uh, offer online courses um, to people who, who pretty much just sign up and want the, the fundamentals in, in psychedelic, um, psychedelic medicine or psychedelic theory. Yeah, thanks, Martin. It's definitely a <clears throat> rapidly growing space and I think one to keep an eye on. Um, so I'm wondering um, if anyone else wants to chime in on, um, yeah, why this is such a, a problem uh, and also with both the above ground, like medicalized models as well as the underground. Uh, I want to chime in uh, briefly just because one of the, um, the bells I'm frequently hammering on is that uh, there is not as far as I found in the clinical trial materials I reviewed and the um, kind of keeping up with the literature in this space for quite a while, um, I have not encountered yet a manualized, clear uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. That is to say that what psychedelic psychotherapy 
looks like in practice, how, how it is done uh, with a client or patient um, is still very much a mystery to me. Uh, it, it's something I started sort of asking about when I was involved in the Guild of Guides, uh, attending that back, you know, a, over a decade ago, um, trying to really understand, well, what what was the psychedelic therapy that these folks were doing and not being able to get a clear answer? So it's something I've been uh, just perpetually curious about. And, and as things have gone more mainstream and there have been more clinical trials trying to really understand. And um, I think one of the issues with that is, and and this this it could stem from a number of things like underground practices kind of bubbling up and influencing what happens in clinical settings. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure, but one of the consequences of it is that for people who are walking in off the street to have a psychedelic uh, assisted experience, whether that's in the underground or in a clinical trial. There's not really a clear expectation uh, as to what that's supposed to look like. So um, what I mean by that is if someone says they're in therapy, a lot of people have some kind of a, a sense, an ability to imagine what that looks like, what the clinical room looks like, what the sorts of conversations they might be having, um, what that kind of process might look like. They might be able to say, well, we're using CBT or we're using, you know, insert uh, method or approach here. Um, with the psychedelic work, I think it's a lot more nebulous. And because it is, and the folks that we've talked to, a pattern that's emerged is um, that one, people are quite desperate uh, by the time they, they're reaching for psychedelics for help. And two, um, there's um, there's a willingness to try anything. That's why one is coming to psychedelics and an openness to, well, maybe this isn't going to look like something that I really um, you know, have done before. And so without that kind of clear understanding of what actually constitutes psychedelic therapy, there's there's a real deficit that that um, and a, a disempowerment to patients and participants who are walking into that room um, because I mean it would be that case even if the psychedelics didn't have um, all the suggestibility enhancing boundary dissolving subjective effects that we understand that they have but you add those into the mix and suddenly. Um, you know, we've heard from admissions from practitioners of lying on top of people, uh, you know, sticking their tongue in somebody's mouth or um, engaging in in forms of touch that are um, just really inappropriate and very clearly outside the norm of any kind of medical practice or what would be considered ethical. And yet, because it's happening in a space that's already been denoted as like a frontier of what therapeutic and healing practices might look like, um, people are kind of more open to that. And then the psychedelics open them even further to that. So I think there's there's a heightened level of vulnerability because of the lack of clarity and a lack of clear expectations of um, or lack of an ability to, to, to walk in kind of expecting what might unfold in that space. Yeah. And I also think there's, there are like issues that sit sort of at the intersection of things that Simon and Martin were just talking about, um, you know, a, uh, a, uh, things as far as like, like I was really, I, I appreciate having the statistics. I think it's, um, uh, it's helpful to have sort of sitting there on the table. And I've also seen people on social media attempt to use those statistics in order to shut things down in order to say, you know, well, well, this isn't special to psychedelia. So, you know, sort of just accept that this comes with the terrain of any therapy or, you know, when Rick Doblin was asked by ABC um, in part of the Four Corners documentary about like, you know, what would it take to stop this? And this and so, well, it's just this just comes with the terrain. This is part of, of, of how it goes. You know, I think. Looking at that on the one hand and then looking at um, some of what, you know, what Martin was saying about um, the press realities, right, about how. And and uh, 
not to hype on the psychedelic renaissance, but like we've been we've been in the psychedelic renaissance or on the verge of a psychedelic renaissance now for what, like 30 years, 20 years. Um, and so there's this and, and this is something that Lily has pointed out before, you know, that that there is this sort of imperative to keep good stories in the news, bad stories out of the news. And then, you know, so, sort of taking that dynamic and looking at the statistics and some of the narratives that come with that. And the way that that these things can come together into this almost perfect storm of silencing, right, into these sort of, in some ways, overt, in other ways, sort of covert. Um, I think in some cases, people, they, there's evidence of really intentional silencing campaigns. I think there's also, you know, in talking to participants in um, clinical trials, you know, because the the press narratives were so positive, you're talking about really vulnerable folks in desperate situations who have treatment resistant conditions and are looking for whatever might get them through that, help them, you know, either cure them or heal them or, or offer some degree of relief. And speaking with people who, even though they didn't get relief or the kind of relief they thought they were going to get based on those media narratives, then didn't want to necessarily paint the clearest picture of how grueling it had been to them because they understood from the media narratives that this stuff worked. And even if it didn't work for them, it worked for other people. So why would they want to deny that potential chance for healing to other people? And the way that that then sort of results in a modulating of behavior or disclosure of experience or, you know, and so I think when there's something about the sort of series of comments that were just made that I think offers a really interesting glimpse into some of the on the ground realities in this sort of nascent uh, therapeutic context and, and the hopes that people have for it. And also like some of the components that I think lead to an atmosphere in which people are unable in some cases to speak up, in other cases, you know, unwilling or uncertain. And then when you throw in exactly what Lily was saying about the uncertainty of what is this revolutionary, new, you know, groundbreaking, never before seen curative therapy supposed to look like, and the, the suggestibility enhancing component of psychedelics. And it becomes, I think, like truly like a perfect storm of narratives and experiences that that become really hard to tease apart before you even get to cases of um you know misconduct and, and abuse of power and so I, I i hope that wasn't too much of a mess it just feels like there's so much going on around that that is is relevant when psychedelic drugs and therapy are in the mix together that i just wanted to call attention to it Thank you, David. I think um, around the media hype as well, which we've seen also really interesting dynamics for quite some time actually in the underground scene where there is a real reluctance to talk about things when they go wrong and a lot of desire to talk about, you know, how wonderful it is. And um, yeah, so we need to have that kind of balanced dialogue. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, Kayla, if you would like to chime in about um, the underground settings, like should this be any different there um, or should these be considered for that setting as well? Yeah, I have so many thoughts from what was just said and I'm glad Dave mentioned um, some of the points on how um, the narrative is used that this is that uh, uh, abuse occurs in regular um, therapeutic settings with outside cadelics is sometimes used as justification for why we shouldn't necessarily pay attention to this very closely. I think, and this might be off topic of the con uh, of the question, but backing up further, I think e even when I go to describe what we're talking about here today and about the um, misconduct that occurred uh in in this very above ground setting um, with Sessa, I think it's really important to highlight that Sessa's conduct um, very much so interacted with the underground scenes and was uh, he was very connected to um, psychedelics outside of clinical settings and and advocacy. But most important is his conduct and behavior in 
numerous instances, including in the Netflix documentary, it alarmed me personally, and I know alarmed others, but it was on it was on display. And I think it's tricky because I have a lot of information and um, I've, I've been uh, really grateful to have contact and conversations with people since um, writing about Ben Sessa that really reaffirm how many people had um, really disturbing interactions with Ben Sessa. And um, I want to tread lightly on how I uh, describe that. But what I am trying to say is um there are patterns of behavior and and conduct that I think are ubiquitous across settings. This isn't exclusive to clinical use or psychedelics or uh, anything like that. These uh, abuses of power are found across every single organization, structure, social group. It, it, it is uh, across the board. And I think it's really necessary to be discussing not just abuse, but the many, many behaviors and comments and types of actions that people take that uh, are celebrated in psychedelics right now. Ben Sessa's uh, glowing reviews of uh, and and sort of disregard for science was celebrated by many people. He was given the biggest platform that you could possibly have in this space. He was a very uh, top person. Why was he celebrated for engaging in such, uh, frankly, sloppy science with some of his publica with, uh, publication critiques, especially the No Such Thing as Blue Mondays, where he drew uh, very strong conclusions off a group of 14 people? Um, back, Anyways, going off topic a bit, but uh, in terms of how it's addressed in the underground, I think we, we need to, it, it's not uh, that there are particular sets of uh, kind of rules that should be applied above ground or underground. I think we need to be looking at, at this as an issue that has been faced by many, many other organizations and groups and that we can learn from. So my work prior came from uh, the Royal Commission into Institutional Child Sexual Abuse, where a government review was done to, in order to uh, develop ways to prevent institutional abuse from happening. There is a lot of research that is done into uh, how structural uh, abuse can happen. And I think that needs to be applied. Uh, and those kind of principles and learnings need to be applied both in, in underground settings and above ground. Oh, thank you, Kayla. Um, Simon, would you like to add a little bit on um, what you've seen from the underground and then we'll go to Martin on similar uh, with the community? Yeah, um, look, I think this sort of abuse does happen in the clinical and the non-clinical settings a lot. Um, I don't think we have any way of knowing exactly how common it is in underground settings um, because there's obviously no reporting and no regulation. And for similar reasons to what David was speaking about in terms of participants in clinical settings not necessarily wanting to openly talk about these experiences that, that they've had in those settings, I actually think similar applies in the underground settings quite a lot um, where there's often quite a lot of uh, idolization of certain underground practitioners and the real fear that if you actually speak out against them on something that they've done that you feel was unacceptable, you risk being outed from that group entirely yourself and being ostracized. Um, and, you know, that, that how can somebody be this popular and this revered in this community if what they're doing isn't okay? So therefore, whatever they've done must be either all right, or maybe I just shouldn't talk about it because other people are just going to think I'm making too big of a deal out of something that really isn't that problematic. And I'll just lose all my friends. I'll lose all my access to these substances. You know, or, or basically it'll have negative consequences on me. So I think really sort of similar uh, in a sense, reasons why people are reluctant to speak out both above and, and underground there. Um, I think, you know, at least in the above ground settings, there are some monitoring bodies and some regulatory framework that you can turn to and that some consequences can be applied. But as we've seen, like those statistics from earlier, a lot of people still aren't speaking out. Um, and even when people are speaking out, a lot of the time, the consequences that are, are laid out, you know, m may be viewed as not really being proportional to the harm done. Um, and I think it's really important to understand why in 
clinical settings, and I'd argue in underground settings as well, I don't actually see there as being a huge difference between the two of those in terms of the power imbalance that exists between the you know, practitioner or whatever you want to call the, the person administering the drugs in the underground and the practitioner in the above ground, um, that essentially vulnerable people are coming to you, uh, putting you in a position of power over them, potentially disclosing a lot of really personal things, um, looking to you for expert input and for like, like acceptance, you know, like the, the Rogerian sort of psychology term of acceptance that that you're expecting them to actually give you unconditional positive regard and absolute worth and be empathetic towards you um, and, and accept you for who you are. And that, that acceptance creates a sense of attachment. Um, and often that may be the first or only sense of positive or healthy attachment you might have had in your life or one of very few examples that you've ever actually had. That acceptance and that attachment feels extremely powerful and is then really open to abuse. And I think it, it goes two ways. You know, I think there's, there's obviously situations where there's just outright sexual abuse. And then there's situations where the practitioner is not identifying what the patient may see as genuine feelings towards the practitioner as a consequence of the therapy. They're not genuine in that sense. You know, it's not the same as meeting someone outside that context and forming a sense of healthy attachment and romantic um, liking for another individual. It's, it, you know, where those feelings pop up within a therapeutic context, there are really clear psychological reasons why they have arisen there. And that's why they're not supposed to be acted on in that setting. Um, uh, regardless of how real they feel to patient or to therapist, that, that, you know, really any therapist should be able to understand why those feelings have emerged and why it's inappropriate and unacceptable to act on them. And I think the reason that it's inappropriate and unacceptable is that it causes a lot of harm. Like if you've um, gone through a course of therapy with someone and formed this sense of secure attachment with them and given them a sense of acceptance and, you know, the whole reason they might be in your office is because they've never really had consistent experiences like that in other relationships. And you then turn that around to take advantage of them, have a, an intimate, romantic or sexual relationship with them. And that then, you know, sort of corrodes and erodes and falls away. They're going to be extremely traumatized. By that experience you know it just shows them that even that that anyone they trust and let into their heart is likely to take advantage of them in the future and that's often the core root of people's issues when they've had that sort of trauma in the past to begin with so furthering that trauma furthering that sense of inability to trust others inability to love yourself is only worsening the root causes of all the issues that they were there to talk to you about in the first place and that causes an immense amount of harm it also makes it far less likely that they're going to feel comfortable going through the sort of therapy that might eventually help them in the future as well, because they've tried that. And what happened was you've just completely obliterated their trust in the entire system. So now they're on their own. Now they're isolated. Now there's nowhere left for them to turn. And that's when really, really bad outcomes are so much more likely to occur like suicides. Um, so I think it's really important to understand that the, the harm from this is not the same as the harm from a relationship breaking down outside this context. You know, it's not just a breakup. It's a, it's, it's that, and, and there are other situations I think where that power imbalance applies. You know, employers, employees, research supervisors, graduate students, um, you know, teachers and adult students. All of these things, you know, they exist in other contexts, but I think they are still quite different in the therapeutic context where you are forming that sense of deep trust and trying to foster someone's sense of safety and security as a therapeutic tool. Um, so the harm is very, very real, and that's why it's not acceptable. And I think that harm is just as likely in the underground as in the clinical context. So I think, you know, it, it, to me, it's no different whether you're seeing someone clinically or, or informally. I think, once again, uh, Simon has just uh, summed up and distilled my, my points far more eloquently and succinctly than I could do. Um, Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Um, what I wanted to do is to come back to this sort of idea of, of community because I think that really is, is foundational, um, both underground and above ground. But uh, one, one thing that was really starting to sort of come home to me just then is this sort of, uh, I guess it was in the military, I think, that, that don't, don't look, don't tell, is that what it is, I think? Um, that whole idea of um, walking past things that you would that you would normally, in many cases, pay attention to, but for whatever reason, um, and there are many reasons for it, then uh, these these concerns are not expressed. And so, 
I suspect uh, all of us here in this on this panel and the many many people um, watching this uh, panel discussion now would be aware of people in the past who have been um, behaving in ways that we're not personally comfortable with. But for whatever reason, we've actually not um, we've not called them out on that behaviour. We haven't made our concerns known, and I think that extends beyond the individual to the community as well. And so, um, back to Dr. Sessa, I, I suspect that a number of people had seen certain behaviours that caused concern, but it would appear that nobody actually brought brought those concerns to the attention of either Dr. Sessa or to other people who might have been able to help or intervene in some way. And I suspect that's been a, a significant issue um, for uh, yeah, for many years in, in the community more broadly. Um, again, this is not in any way to exonerate the people who should take responsibility for their actions, but I do feel that there's become a, a splintering of fragmentation of, of community to the extent that people are actually not inclined to, to speak up and speak out um, for, for mutual care and mutual benefit. Uh, thank you, Martin. And I think that is a really important point. And um, it's even more compounded in the underground because of the fact that it's engaging in an illegal activity. So then trying to report it to police um, is also talking about being uh, involved in a criminal event yourself. And that is definitely a barrier to reporting. But on top of that, there is that real, um, I think, fear of rejection from the community. Uh, so um, back to you, though, Martin. Uh, what is done in the research settings in Australia to safeguard against misconduct? Uh, what are the proposed safeguards for the, the clinical setting? Uh, could you talk us through some of that? Sure. So um, certainly in research settings in Australia and, and globally, uh, research is, is quite highly regulated in terms of ethical uh, oversight and and. Um, Close sort of uh, close reportage of of, um, of the conduct. I'm not saying misconduct, but the conduct of clinical trials, uh, and that is um, it's really been an evolutionary process. I'd say for the last fifty or sixty years in clinical research, um, quite possibly from around the time of the first first wave of psychedelic uh, clinical practice as it happens. Uh, although I'm not necessarily drawing a drawing a connection there. Um, and so um, certainly that uh, ethics committee or ethical oversight of, of clinical research is, is very front and centre and um, that extends in general, as you might be aware, to um, the use of therapist dyads, so two, two therapists in the room um, pretty much at all, all times, uh, video recording of sessions. It's interesting, of course, to note that the, that the MAPS um, uh, case did include video recording, but it just simply didn't didn't work in that in that instance, and it may not work in other instances in terms of um, preventing or controlling or um, circumventing uh, some of the misconduct that we have seen around the world. Um, and so, as I say, video recording and and careful oversight from. Um, uh, from review boards and, uh, and of course, a close-knit research team, I think, is very important. Um, this is going to be very interesting and it's of some concern to us in, in the translation from clinical research to clinical practice because um, although the Therapeutic Goods Administration has specified that, um, that any aspiring authorised prescribers who at this stage can only be psychiatrists in Australia, um, will need to present a, uh, a research or, sorry, a clinical protocol to an ethics committee for their involvement and their essentially sign-off. Um, we still feel that there are significant limitations to that process because there's no, as far as we know, there's no specification for ongoing oversight. Clinical research normally requires annual, um, most always requires annual updates and reports to the to the ethics committee to ensure that things are remaining on track. There doesn't appear to be that facility in the in the current ruling in the TGA. So we would like to um, find ways to ensure that uh, that uh, either the TGA or the Australian Psychological Society um, or the um, or another organisation somehow has the 
remit to to oversee clinical translation to clinical practice and to to try and avoid these sort of these um, almost inevitable, I would say, uh, risks of misconduct. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, that's good to know. And Simon, did you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that there's obviously those safeguards in, in research settings. There's the regulations and the codes of conduct and stuff in clinical settings. But, you know, as Martin pointed out, even in, in pretty highly monitored research settings, there have been, you know, abuses that have occurred. Um, it's no good filming sessions if no one's going to actually watch them later. Um, and then you're still relying on the clinicians essentially to actually report um, abuse if they've perpetrated it is not a particularly robust system. Um, and I think, you know, to, um, to I think Lily's point as well around that uncertainty of what expectations are within the therapy room that um, I wonder about some, you know, practical approaches in terms of giving, giving, giving patients and clients a really clear understanding at the outset of what is not considered acceptable behaviour and that that may actually be best coming from a body external to your therapist. Um, as in someone else, if it's a clinical trial setting, maybe it's the PI or someone who's not actually directly involved in delivering the therapy to that particular person so that they know that from the stance of the organisation, this is not acceptable. If something happens that's outside of these goalposts, that's something you need to actually escalate. Here's the process for doing that. Here's the person to contact to raise these concerns. It will not reflect badly on you. It will not impact your participation in future studies. You know, just essentially say, we need to know for the good of everyone going through this process, if something like this happens, please tell us there's a pathway for this and here's what that is. Um, and to, to sort of additionally actually potentially say up front, to people entering this space, psychedelics are likely to dissolve boundaries, intensify a sense of oneness, intensify a sense of attachment formation. This is a risk in normal therapy, yes, but these risks are going to be intensified in this setting and that, that probably goes two ways. You know, that the therapist as well, their mirror neurons are going to be firing off. They're going to be sensing a deeper sense of empathy than they might in normal therapeutic environments as well. And, you know, just so that they're aware, that there, there is some risk of a sense of romantic transference that is higher than it might be in a non-psychedelic therapy setting and also that it already exists in that you know non-psychedelic assisted therapy setting so identify those risks up front so that the client can actually be on the lookout for them as well as well as really clear information to anyone who's going to be delivering this therapy you know it shouldn't actually be on the patient to monitor for and report these things the therapist also needs to be aware particularly where some therapists coming into this space may actually have less exposure to psychedelics than i think we would want them to have had i'm um, not saying that's always going to be the case but you know given the, the current regulations and the fact that it's illegal to take these things in this country but these guys are going to be prescribing them um they may not actually be as aware of just how big that boundary uh, blurring is with psychedelics and, and how much that sort of sense of oneness actually evolves. So I think any anyone going into this in the therapy or the research setting also needs to be really clearly just told up front, these things are never acceptable, it's not okay, and here's why it's a bigger risk. And then the use of really careful and open supervision which, you know, is in most psychotherapy settings an expectation, but how it's delivered and how intensive it is varies a lot, um, to actually give therapists an opportunity to openly discuss where there are romantic countertransfers occurring, you know, where, where they're starting to develop those senses of romantic attachment, because ultimately that signals something going in within the clinician, going on within the clinician, that needs to be worked on as well if they're going to be able to continue to do that work safely and effectively, um, which isn't a way of like, scrutinizing or criticizing the clinician for having those feelings it's about identifying them so that they can be worked through and not acted on um, and every psychotherapy textbook i've ever read talks very openly about the possibility for romantic transference and romantic countertransference um, and the fact that identifying that is super important and not only important so that you don't act on it think it's real and act on it but important because it's an important therapeutic tool like you can you can actually then question why those transferences and countertransferences are occurring in that setting and use that to actually help further the therapy that you're trying to do and achieve better outcomes for the client. Um, so I think some of that stuff in this context actually just needs to be really clearly set up up front with open information to client and to therapist with pathways for complaints, pathways for supervision, so that there are really robust structures both on the therapist end and on the client end that can identify and prevent these things from going further into abusive territory.
Yeah, thank you, Simon. Um, you brought up some really great points there. And I'm um, hoping that uh, we might start with Lily uh, and um, if you could elaborate on some of that and then maybe touch on some of the issues with organizational culture and ethics and um, vetting practices. Seems that there's a lot of questions about why people end up in positions of um, power. Sure. Yeah, um, just to dovetail some of the excellent points that have already been made. Um, you know, the there's an interesting issue that has come up in research where uh, clinicians may be giving different therapy to people who are on drugs versus people who are in the placebo group. It's very hard to blind these trials. And then the quality of the therapy is different between the two arms. And I think that's actually something that we've heard about from a few different participants, including participants who were in the placebo groups. Um, so yeah, I, I also just in terms of of communities and how uh, communities respond to some of this, there's sort of two two aspects I want to touch on very briefly. One is that um, how people respond to victims and survivors of abuse and misconduct, whether that's sexual in nature or financial or emotional, because it can take a lot of different shapes. Um, I think something that I've experienced myself and heard a lot about are community responses or responses from people in the community that are very much about protecting the psychedelics, protecting the reputation of the psychedelics at the expense of people who use them rather than centering and prioritizing um, the person who's been harmed, who's coming forward and saying, Hey, something happened to me and I'm, I need to talk about it or I need help. And that's where the silencing starts to begin. It happens in the, those kinds of one-on-one -on -one contexts. Um, so I think that there is absolutely work that needs to be done in terms of upskilling community members to understand what a uh, victim or survivor centered mode of responding looks like one that takes care for the person in front of you as the priority um, over and above the abstract notion of the psychedelic renaissance. Um, but the sort of flip side to that is um, to do with, you know, people talk about things like whisper networks, which isn't really how I like to think about it so much as gossip. I think gossip has a really important safety, um, like it's an important safety mechanism. Gossip is one of those things I think has been denigrated and minimized. Um, it's often quite gendered and associated as like being something that women do or maybe queer folks do, which is another way of kind of denigrating it and sidelining it as a not important mode of communicating knowledge and information to each other, but also the flip side of that is that uh, women and queer folks and non-binary folks are more often statistically the, the victims of sexual harm and, and gendered violence. And so gossip isn't so much about, uh, you know, I'm not talking about gossip that's like, oh my God, did you hear about blah? I'm talking about gossip where people are saying, hey, I heard that this person isn't safe. Um, hey, you know, this, this is, these are the murmurings that I'm hearing, you know, this hasn't, it, it doesn't have to be reported in the news media for it to be important information for people to have in the community so that they can make choices um, based on what's going to feel safe for them. Um, in terms of like, Simon, you made the point about how there should be really clear guidelines and expectations about these are some of the things that are, are not acceptable and the modes of filing a complaint and how that needs to come from an external body. I just wanted to make two comments about that. One, I think it's a really important point. And I think that, that its source being an external body is important for a couple of reasons. Um, but one of them is that we have heard of a number of cases in which a problematic practitioner with multiple allegations of abuse from multiple people will say um, that they uh, something they experienced from the practitioner was this kind of like, oh, we're never going to cross a sexual boundary. That's never going to happen here. But it's said in a way that almost is like planting the idea of a of an of a them being special and then having a sexual relationship. Um, there's like really insidious, bizarre ways that practitioners. We've heard stories of practitioners manipulating clients into sexual relationships by establishing this real like, well, that's never going to happen here. But then when the person's in an altered state, they initiate touch and contact that it has a kind of a sexual quality or a sensual quality to it. And things kind of escalate from there. Um, and so I think having that actually be like really cut and dry from an outside source 
undercuts that manipulation tactic. Um, when it comes to um, that outside source, um, I just wanted to very briefly say a lot of the external bodies that are kind of popping up uh, around the world seem to very much be about people who are already invested in the psychedelic medicalization project wanting to have a hand in regulating that project. I think it's absolutely paramount that anybody that is going to be claiming to do oversight, accountability, uh, setting of norms and guidelines have significant um, input from stakeholders who are outside the community, who are psychedelic skeptical or psychedelic naive or psychedelic neutral, um, have input from people who've experienced harm and have insight into what that looks like, um, have input from bioethicists who are just like total nerds in that space and maybe just getting acquainted with what's going on in the psychedelic spaces. Um, I think that until and unless those bodies have that diversity of voices, um, it's going to be really hard to get this right and have really credible guidelines and accountability processes in place. Uh, then the question was about um, organizational structures and vetting and power. Um, I'm going to hand that one to Dave in just two ticks, but I think one of the things I wanted to say was that when we talk about who is educating or training people to become practitioners in whatever vein, um, I think that those training entities have two primary functions. The first is that they are training people in a concrete form of therapy and practice that is discussed, debated, studied, more robust than just like, oh, yes, Dan Groff has been writing about it since the 80s. Um, and two, that it is their role and responsibility to have mechanisms for identifying individuals who should not be practicing um, and for ensuring that those people do not then become authorized and supported and with a stamp of approval to go out and practice in the community. Um, and I also think that um, there's... There's something... I wish got talked about more, which is there are those who seek power and who seek out these positions because it gives them access to vulnerable people. And those people concern me greatly, but there are also consequences to being the clinician who is administering psychedelics to patients. What I mean by that is that psychedelics can cause, even if it's not like a romantic transference thing, they can cause feelings of profound gratitude and appreciation for the person who's bestowing this experience upon you by giving you access to this medicine that's, you know, helping you or making you feel really good in the moment. Um, there's idealization that can happen of the practitioner. I think especially when we're talking about psychedelic therapists, clinicians, practitioners, whose primary modality involves giving people psychedelics, those people are spending a lot of time around patients and, clin and clients who are on psychedelics. And then they're subject to a lot more of that kind of golden shadow transference, counter transference dynamic that I don't think is good for people. I don't think that it yields like better clinicians who are engaged in better practice. And I don't think that it's a reflection of reality. It's a reflection of how the drugs are making their patients feel. And if a clinician doesn't have the skills to be able to like give the power back to the client and be able to sidestep some of those dynamics um, and to know how it is that they can manage and organize their own practice to ensure that they are minimizing the risks associated with this. And that includes supervision, but also includes maybe not having yourself in the room with people who are on drugs three days a week with nobody else to supervise or monitor what's going on there. Um, I think that handling, like taking some of these points seriously demands in my opinion, a pretty serious um, restructuring of what psychedelic therapy looks like, what psychedelic clinics look like, what psychedelic training looks like. Um, I think it would take potentially years to develop um, more robust approaches that would handle some of this. And it would mean having new organizations um, that were better equipped to 
more thoughtfully respond to some of this. I'm pretty cynical. I don't even know that that's really possible. And I tend to think that organizational structures and institutions in general reward really problematic behavior. Um, that happens to be my position, but I know lots of other people are perhaps more hopeful and I'm trying not to rain on everyone's parade. Thanks. Lily. Yeah, I'm uh, inclined to agree with a lot of that. I think to um, just grabbing onto that last point for a moment, you know, I have had conversations with people involved in, um, you know, some of the new corporate psychedelic endeavors that are conducting research or more commonly like trying to figure out how to get something to market because they think that they're close enough with whatever phase two or phase three that they've got or that they're hoping to get to. And, um, you know, when discussing the MDMA clinical trials and pointing out uh, that when I was asked basically what, what would my solution be to the issues that that um, we covered in Power Trip, uh, you know, and I suggested that fine, accept the the phase one research and take MDMA clinical trials back to phase two and run robust uh, clinical trials that don't have the litany of issues that we documented. And uh, the person they didn't quite start laughing, but they, they seemed totally exasperated because they made the point that nobody was, was going to spend the time and the money needed to, to do that. And it's like, yes, but the results that are currently published don't actually hold up once you start unpacking, you know, all of the unpublished goings on. And in that moment, you know, it was a really clear uh, message from this particular institutional actor that for him and his company and their investors, you know, the concern was less about robust research and potential risks to uh, participants and would be patients than it was, you know, what will be tolerable to the people giving us the money and hoping for a return on their investment. And I think the issues with institutions are, are, rather simple and and I don't think psychedelic institutions are unique in that when you form an institution there's a certain desire to maintain and perpetuate the institution and so frequently you see that there is a willingness to engage in silencing and cover-ups and um I mean I'm I'm inclined to comment on what's currently going on with Boeing but I don't think that uh you know, I, that's a whole other can of worms. But but sticking more closely to Ben Sessa and psychedelic institutions, I think in the case of, of Sessa, there's actually a really clear history. I think, you know, I can point to my own Twitter account where back in 2020, I highlight, highlighted the fact that Sessa was making fundamentally misleading comparisons with his study for MDMA for alcohol use disorder, comparing it with totally different study, you know, superimposing graphs from studies that had nothing to do with each other, uh, over each other, posting the results on Twitter and talking about how groundbreaking MDMA therapy was. And in that tweet, I explicitly said that the rare cases of, of study participant suicides underscored the reasons that I had concerns about this kind of false advertising, that when you are, are making these sorts of marketing pitches and appeals to extremely vulnerable subsets of the population, there is, as Simon talked about earlier, like a heightened risk for what happens when, when things go wrong in those contexts. And I think I mean, I can say like like Simon's point about vulnerability and, and who can you trust in the wake of therapist abuse is an issue that Lily and I have run up on uh, quite frequently when when talking to folks who have been through uh, clinical trials or in some cases in the underground, because as was also pointed out, uh, these drugs are still largely uh, scheduled, criminalized. Um, treated in ways where uh, it's not easy to get access. And the reality of this field is that there are circles of clinicians and sanctioned folks who are all taking these drugs and running therapy circles and supervision circles and whatever else 
uh, you know, maybe maybe you have a day job teaching some sort of psychedelic certificate program and you moonlight as a practitioner or you moonlight as somebody who holds circles, including for other, like in some cases, licensed therapists. And this is uh, seen as an avenue in which you can get training. Well, when people wind up harmed in those contexts, you now have all of these different institutional imperatives uh, you have, right, the sort of, as we've talked about, like the cultural um, closeness of everybody who's been in that sort of underground circle. But at the point where you've got multiple people who have affiliations, uh, say, like we covered issues tied to the California Institute of Integral Studies in the podcast. And when you have, you know, professors who are moonlighting as shamans or who are moonlighting as drug dispensing therapists to their peers, um, you also have the question of how the institution that these folks have day jobs at uh, will or won't act in order to preserve its reputation, its institutional functionality. And then in the cases of some of the uh, the clinical trials, such as with MAPS, one of the, the responses to harmed study participants has to highlight that they were, you know, effectively that they were broken when they got here. Oh, these were people who had, um, you know, uh, treatment resistant, whatever. And therefore we didn't know that we would be able to cure them. Weren't we good for being willing to take a chance? You know, if, if we didn't improve them, it's not on us. They were like that when we found them. And so I think, uh, not, it's not only that it's um, sort of a morass of of where people place their own personal interests in the context of building a career, advancing that career, developing a reputation. Um, it's also the sort of heightened realities that come with building an institution and trying to fundraise and get clout and get reputation and get investors and uh, again, Simon made that wonderful point about what organizations will or will not tolerate and setting setting the standards. Uh, but you run into a problem or you can run into problems if you are uh, effectively trying to mainstream what has long been a criminal, criminalized subculture. And I don't mean that in a value sense or pejorative, like, I mean, criminal simply as in it is illegal to possess or use or distribute these drugs, manufacture, what have you. Um, and so when you have a bunch of people who know where the bodies are buried, so to speak, who have been engaged in criminalized activity with each other over the years, um, and then you're trying to create a public facing organization, it may be hard to curl, curtail bad behavior uh, at the point where people have the goods on each other. I mean, we know for, we we interviewed, somebody already mentioned the, the MAPS uh, abuse that was caught on video. I mean, we interviewed therapists at that study site who told us that they had, uh, specifically told Doblin that they requested not to have Richard Jensen as one of the the therapists on site, after, you know, because uh, he was brought in after the study had already started. And so I think looking at that and looking at the protestations of uh, Jensen's colleagues who, who didn't want him there, who were ostensibly concerned about what could happen and looking at what ultimately did happen, um, it raises real questions about that uh, institutional willingness to to create hard and fast boundaries and to call out potentially bad actors and bad behavior. And I think too, looking at at Ben Sessa's history, I mean, I have I I uh, a, a researcher forwarded me a, an email from Sessa back in 2018, um, tied to a. a lecture he was giving at Esalen that I, I found quite disturbing. And over the years, I have tried to call attention to some of these behaviors in, in different arenas. Um, that doesn't mean I knew that that something like what transpired was going to transpire, but I would say there are enough red flags. Um, for example, when I look at the the Twitter case, these, these superimposed graphs and the misleading statements about alcohol use disorder, if Sessa's colleagues had called attention to that rather than uh, eventually publishing it on Awaken, uh, the pharmaceutical company 
website, if rather than publishing it in the Journal of Psychopharmacology, you know, with the chief editor of David Nutt, one of Sess's close colleagues, if not friends, um, when you look at the way some of this problematic behavior within the context of research was ultimately um, enabled by people in in his professional and social circles like i i wonder what things would have looked like if there was more willingness to uh intervene in sort of some of this wider behavior um across this field and i guess just at the end of the day i i just want to underscore with regards to institutions um you know i think a lot of people feel that that who who are they to punish uh somebody else whether it's a colleague or a friend or a mentor or whatever and i think an underlying and overarching reality in cases like like this should be that that it's not i mean maybe in some cases it's about penalizing the practitioner but there are real questions about what it takes to keep the community safe and looking at community safety rather than a sort of uh carceral or punitive uh judgment or justice system is sort of the lens that i would like to orient these kinds of proceedings, processes, accountability, whatever's through. Yeah, thanks, David. Definitely better to um, have a prevention rather than um, dealing with it later. Uh, so we're pretty much down to um, just the last couple of general questions to the group. So um, anyone can chime in, but then also we'll, we'll go to some concluding remarks. But Okay, so uh, what are the positives in the current models and what can we do better regarding ethical practices? And um, on that note, Australia is the first country to reschedule psilocybin and MDMA for specific clinical uses. What could we learn or what could we demonstrate to the world in, in this um, process? A couple of different points I was thinking about while we are talking about uh, just previously, but uh, I guess to to go to the question of what are the positives in the in the current um, practice is I I do want to be hopeful, but unfortunately I fall on the side of rather um, pessimistic. Sometimes also probably similar to uh, to Lily as she mentioned, but um, I. I, I am hopeful in terms of what I've written about this case. I had a lot of really beautifully positive feedback and a lot of people who uh, really resonated with the experience of recognizing that there was harmful behavior that had previously occurred, that this was not surprising, and that they really wanted to see different systems. And I think there are more people coming in from interdisciplinary uh, practice and fields uh, coming into psychedelics that I think is going to be beneficial. And that includes people like myself who came in as a PhD student after having worked in uh, mental health services for a number of years. Uh, and I'm hopeful that bringing in and having more people who have um, who have faced these uh, issues in other settings will be able to bring about some um, positive changes. I do think that there are at the core, I mean, I'll say across the board, I, I don't support the MAPS manual of, of therapy and I don't support that therapy being used for MDMA. I think that's extremely dangerous. Um, and that the actual content of that therapeutic manual leaves open so many doors to unethical behavior and that there is a real concern that at the highest levels we've seen demonstrated over and over and over an inability to make uh, assessments on who should be delivering psychedelic therapy. Like Dave just mentioned, there were a number of people who warned about Jensen. This I would heard about about other people in the field as well, that there are, are warnings that aren't heeded. And that comes from the connections at the very uh, highest levels of, of who's protecting each other. I think that um, something I really wanna see is complaint handled differently <laughs> and better. I wrote an article about the responses of people who are quite closely tied to Ben Sessa um, I, I wrote a medium piece that really pointed to um, 
David Nutt, Robin Carhart Harris, Mind Medicine Australia. Um, I think there was some others I mentioned that not only have they not said anything about this, but they posted and continued their social media as though nothing were happening. So I, I think it's really important to look at that and that um, the responses we have had from those organizations have been ex very minimal or just completely pretending that the situation isn't happening. Um, that's deeply in inappropriate. And uh, I very much hope that people will look very closely at those people and organizations and consider how much influence they continue to have in this space. Yeah, thanks, Kayla. Uh, I think that's interesting uh, um, because as this is a, a rapidly evolving space and there isn't that many groups that are training people yet, but there are a few. And um, Ben Sester actually worked for quite a few of them when he did come over for Australia. So it wasn't just one, like he, um, he actually quite widely trained while he was here. And um, I guess as such, there, uh, yeah, you do have to to question to some extent um, what processes are we using uh, to judge the merit of who should be leading the way on this. Um, and then as for who's actually working in the field, that can become a little bit trickier when you're talking about an accreditation process. So I think that's going to be a, a conversation we'll have to keep coming back to. Um, Simon, did you want to extend on that? Um, look, I think really great points Kayla and I really appreciated your writing on the you know on this particular point around um, Ben Sasser and those findings um, on the institution sort of not responding and even individuals you know carefully uh, or closely you know allied with him not sort of making any formal statements about this publicly um, it to me seems similar in a way that um, you know, a lot of people in the underground would, would see uh, the way police handle allegations of misconduct against police officers, right? Um, that the, the police will, broadly speaking, seemingly just say, oh, this is that one particular individual and we don't really need to talk about it beyond saying they did the wrong thing and now they're, you know, they've been sanctioned or there's been some internal process uh, taken against them and that's, that's enough. Um, I don't think that is enough and I think we want to see better. Uh, and I think, um, I think it, I understand the reticence of groups, particularly where there's a lot of commercial interest behind them, not wanting to be seen to contribute to negative publicity. But I think ultimately it makes them look worse. You know, I think it really erodes public trust and faith in the whole thing. Um, to be honest, I think it would look a lot better and put a lot more uh, trust back into the field if they actually approach it very, very head on. And said, look, this this is an issue. And yes, this this was one individual, but it, it's happened many, many times. And we can't just put it down to each individual as it pops up because that's not good enough. How do we then say that we're protecting people who are coming in for these services? We need to look at this as a systems issue because obviously it is a systems issue. Um, and the way that particular individuals and their vulnerabilities interplay with the system and the system's vulnerabilities is a, a, a systems issue. It's not an individual issue. Um, so this is a problem. It's happened. It shouldn't have happened. Here's what we need to do to try and stop it from happening again in the future. To me, is a much more mature, much more sensible and ultimately much more helpful approach then A, pretending it never happened, or B, saying, all right, it happened, but it was just that one guy. Um, and that guy's out, so all good now. We don't really need to look at it any further. You know, I just don't think that actually inspires, and it certainly doesn't increase my trust in the system um, that, you know, is going to be handling a lot of very vulnerable people. Um, and and it, it just, you know, I think it actually just needs to be tackled a, a lot more head on than it has been. Yeah, especially when we've seen like specifically iterating that, you know, this um, wasn't while he was working with us, kind of just that like pushing away as far as they can from the whole thing, which again was also why Patch um, was, was initiated, was like, let's not just keep pushing this aside. Let's actually have that conversation. Let's go, actually, there is a problem. What do we, what do we want to do about this? How are we going to stop it from continuing? Um, Lily, did you want to add to that? So one comment I think is um, that there is actually an established field of sexual violence prevention. Um, and there are, you know, whether it's bystander intervention or programs that work to um, enhance people's ability to resist sexual harm or programs that are aimed at, at perpetrators to try to prevent them from engaging in further harm or populations that are at higher risk of perpetration. I think um, 
you know, there, there is an existing field. There are people who know a lot about this and they think this is another one of those places where there's no need to reinvent the wheel or build from the ground up. There are credible experts who can be brought in to do that kind of work. And I feel like I've made that point a lot and I've actually been involved in that kind of work outside of psychedelic spaces. And it really kind of cracks me up that to this day, uh, there has, I, I've never gotten a knock on my door, even for a referral um, to people that might be within my broader network of international sexual violence preventionists and people who are very up to date on that research and uh, modes of practice in communities. Um, so I, I think that it's it, it's really uh, we, we're not alone on this. You know, there's there's methods that have been tried elsewhere that that can be implemented here. Um, and I think one of one of the last points I wanted to make is just that. For the, as long as I've been involved in the psychedelic, whatever it is now, I would be, I would probably use a negative <laughs> word there, so I'll just sidestep around it. But for as long as I've been involved in this space, um, I have heard people say explicitly that uh, forms of abuse and misconduct and harm are not going to be talked about because it would hurt the broader movement. And this, you know, it's ends justifies the means thinking. And my response to that in many cases is like, but but there's hundreds and hundreds of people who have experienced this kind of harm. And no, we don't have robust data on incidents and prevalence, but we have enough people coming forward that there's something very concerning here. Um, and we have enough practitioners who the way that they speak about their the therapy that they're doing is downright authoritarian and like should signal to people that there's something very concerning here about the mode of practice that they're engaged in. But really, I think for me, part of what it boils down to is that it, ultimately the means are the ends. And when we're thinking about, you know, if psychedelics are, are supposed to revolutionize mental health or change the world in some way, you know, that has to begin in the process by which we seek to achieve that end. So it's not about like, throwing bodies under the rug until we get to a certain point and then we can start the big healing party. It's like, you know, for me, I think for a long time, I've sort of thought, well, it almost seems like people aren't taking the same drugs that I'm taking because the drugs that I took were drugs that were like, Hey, look at that thing, sit with that thing. And it might be uncomfortable and maybe you don't want to look at it, but Hey, if you look at it and you, and you learn how to hold it and, and, confront it with compassion, like maybe it's going to melt away or transform into something else or like turn into a little fairy and do a dance, you know, like who knows weird shit happens on drugs. But, but I think, I think that that's something that I, if I, if I have hope for anything or long for anything, it's that that piece of the experience, which has been so, so much at the heart of my own drug use and that that sense of revolution, you know, is something that that in and of itself and the way that we go about it isn't harming people and isn't marginalizing people and isn't discarding people, but is instead, um, you know, finding radical ways to um, deal with shit. Uh, that That's something that I want to be a part of. And I, uh, at this point, I don't actually consider myself part of the psychedelic community. I don't see myself in the values that I see put into play in so much of the global psychedelic community. I don't feel that I belong there. In fact, I've been told very explicitly that I don't um, because of the what I value and because of whose voices I want to listen to and who I want to center. And so in that sense, you know, I, I, I say this as an outsider who would very much like to um, have a reason to, to come back into a community that I once felt very at home in. Thank you, Lily. Um, yeah, I really like the points that you raised there. Um, wondering, David, if you've got anything to add to that one? Probably nothing as eloquent as was just said. Um, I, I There's a couple points that just I appreciate that in these kinds of conversations, there are frequently folks uh, pushing for the positive and wanting to highlight, you know, the the what is good that is um, taking place. And and I was thinking earlier today about you know being uh, in my late teens, early twenties, and and quite enamored with. Uh, psychedelia and both you know as far as things going on in the underground and the research and you know obviously like i i found many positives in it and i still find many positives with regards to psychedelics 
uh, for me, looking at this project of medicalization and the more recently, let's say like the, the corporatization, the commercialization, the desire of certain figures to change it from, you know, some sort of underground subculture into a mainstream uh, construct. You know, I, I, it has troubled me for many years. It continues to trouble me because I think the product project of mainstreaming is that of showing that your values are continuous with those of dominant culture. And when we look around at dominant culture and the realities that club come with, you know, climate change and uh, white supremacism and patriarchy and and all of these oppressive and hugely damaging systems like what lily just said i think in a very sort of personal manner like i don't want to be part of a subculture that is insistent and intent on showing that no we're just as normal as the people who are chewing up the planet for profit and subjugating as many people as they can in pursuit of you know whatever like i'm not interested i mean that was that was part of i think what came with the allure of psychedelic subcultures and the weirdos and freaks and delightful people that that uh, existed and still exist in many of these spaces. And I think in recent years, I've had to remind myself frequently that the sort of mainstream institutionalized psychedelia is not psychedelia full stop it is a small subset you know you, it is the counter counter culture if you will um and and i think you know honestly when i when i when i find myself asked with things of like what are the positives you know my my instinct is uh almost to run from anything medicalization related and sort of like look at things like the the different drug testing initiatives that have been, you know, the autonomous sort of mutual aid groups doing, you know, festival support and drug testing and, um, you know, peer support through whatever range of crisis thing. And I think peer support has its place in some, some things. There are other things that I think it's entirely unsuitable for. And I think it's important to not decide that one particular approach is a key to every lock, but, but, when I think about the things that are positive in psychedelia, you know, conversations like this, finding other people who are invested in having these difficult, fraught uh, conversations and recognizing that there is some degree of mess to be made before we can start talking and figuring out solutions, because the problems are so much larger, I think, than any of us realize. Um and so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not an answer in the medical context, but uh, I, I definitely appreciate moments like this to sort of chew on the issues and hope that like other people are doing it in their own sort of small spaces and, and that those conversations as they continue to ripple out, I mean, the heads of the field can, can continue to bury their heads in the sand and ignore it and whatever else. And that won't, uh, that can't stop the demand, the wider demands for change as people continue to recognize that they want more, they want better, they want things different than so many of these institutions are, are willing to have it be. Thank you so much for those points. And um, I think this is why de decriminalizing um, psychedelics is so important as well. Um, but I think in a nutshell, I kind of can distill down some of that returning to your roots and what I think a lot of us found when we first got into a psychedelic experience, yeah, like confronting things that were not easy to address. And it's kind of strange to see then uh, how things have taken quite a turn um, by pushing through with, with money, but also reverence has come up so many times. And this is where we get guruism in the underground and where we will have problems with doctors. It is exactly the same thing. You'll have these people with this wow experience and this reverence. And after a while, it does have an effect on people. And so it is, it's a dynamic thing. It's not just that you've got people who go in going, I'm going to do the bad thing. 
it develops over time and the the reverence that is shown to them kind of also feeds that. And I think it's really important to identify as well that we can, as a community, withdraw that and keep it in balance. Like, you know, thank you, but without all that excessive reverence was just something that really came to mind for me from your responses. Um, uh, Simon and Kayla, would you like to add any final comments? Um, yeah, um, David, totally agree with all of your points. I mean, but, you know, obviously I um, do think that psychedelics in clinical contexts do have a lot of potential. Um, I totally agree. I don't think it is psychedelia. Right? I think, you know, I look at it quite separate too. Um, within saying that, though, the the issues and the risks that we are so aware of happening in underground, particularly in underground, like therapeutic contexts, they're well known. Um, and I think it would pay the people who are pioneering it in these clinical spaces to actually turn to community a lot more than I feel like they have, to worry less about their investors and about the reputation and the image and do it right. Um, because if we bring all of the known issues from the underground context into the clinical context, we have failed. Um, and we are setting people up for a lot of harm. Um, I think we can be a lot more reflective than that. I think we can actually, um, you know, design systems and design approaches that recognise the community knowledge that exists, particularly the community knowledge that exists around the impact these substances have on people's, um, you know, ego, sense of self, that reverence, the the guruism, the sort of the, the stuff that we see so commonly in the underground and say, hey, this is a risk. And already within medical practice, that is a problem. You know, that, that people's sense of self can become quite inflated. Um, and I'm certainly not pretending I could be totally isolated from that, but that that is something that already happens in this field where you are being given a great sense of importance and a role by vulnerable people who you feel like you're playing a role in helping. You need to be very reflective in that context to make sure you don't internalise any of that too much and see it for what it is. Um so I think we do actually just need to turn to community a little bit more and say we, we cannot stand to actually bring these harms up into the clinical space. Um, and likewise, I think within the underground spaces, there needs to be a lot more conversation and open discussion around this sort of stuff and around the abuses that do occur. Because I think broadly speaking, numbers wise, more people are still going to continue to access these these medicines in underground settings and that's even with therapeutic purposes and and then overwhelmingly more people are going to continue to use these things personally in non-regulated settings and these harms need to be looked at reflectively there because there are things that can be done to actually address some of those risks and some of those harms in those contexts as well and simply saying well we'll we'll medicalize it and that will get rid of the problems is completely naive and absurd um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been shown already. And, you know, these things haven't been used for that long in that context in this new wave of research. And there's already all of these examples of significant harm that could have been probably fairly well predicted, probably more, you know, or definitely more could have been done to actually address proactively rather than reactively. Um, and I just feel like that hasn't been done. And I think a lot of that has been centered around an unwillingness to recognize the risks that come with it. And a little bit of sort of a narcissistic, ego-based drive of, well, those harms exist because it's happening in those contexts and it's being, you know, these things are being given out by people without training and we're obviously above that because we've got knowledge, we've got degrees, we've got training, therefore that stuff won't happen here. Um, and that's just dishonest and I think can be approached a lot more realistically and just genuinely a, a, a lot better than it has been. Yeah, thank you, especially the language and the media has a lot to answer for there as well. But like saying that you don't have come downs and side effects if it's in a clinical setting was something actually that Dr. Ben Sessa uh, had, had recently taken issue with and was like, wow, it's just so much out there that he writes about, you know, it's not going to happen if you have ketamine or MDMA in a clinical setting. And you're like, it does not change the pharmacology. Yeah, you can limit and reduce it, but it does not just take it away um so yeah no thank you for pointing that out uh Kayla yeah just a final thing I was uh thinking about is the uh, like who who is harmed by abuses and we've referenced patient a and of course their identity is um confidential but I just want to um highlight that they, as we've said they are not here to share their experience they are they uh are dead 
there are the magnitudes of ripples of harm that that has on not just patient A and their immediate friends and family, but the many other patients of Ben Sessa, knowing that their psychiatrist who they trusted for however long of time was engaged in such egregiously unethical conduct is, um, it's just, you, you can't quantify that level, that these harms. And I think it's really important to consider and think about how many, just how many people are impacted um, when somebody is behaving unethically and that it goes well beyond just, uh, it, it goes well beyond physical or sexual abuse and that these ripples are uh, ultimately um, undermining trust in the entire medical system, as was said before, and uh, people's ability to seek help and get help and support is impacted by this. Um, so when I think about how we respond to this and and the type of considerations we include, um, I I just want to always emphasize that point that um, these the, the magnitude of impact is is um, beyond what we can really even begin to comprehend. I think. Yeah, thank you, Kayla. Um, I really do agree with that so strongly, and I think that is an important point to close on as well. Like the gravity of this is enormous, and I don't think we should ever lose sight of that. Not just specifically this case, but this is just uh, literally like almost textbook what I got taught about at uni as to what can go wrong and why we avoid doing these things. And it is really important that we understand what went wrong and how to avoid that happening in the future and therefore not be shy to actually talk about these things. And especially for those who cannot um, have that voice for themselves even more so. I appreciate that everyone has brought such uh, important points to a very sensitive topic that um, not everyone does want to talk about, but I very much appreciate that you were all willing to come to the table today and give your perspectives and insights into these critical issues. And this will definitely be an emerging uh, topic over time because this is definitely changing formats. We're going to see a lot of things happen in this space, but even that influx of people to the underground because as medical models uh you know in the news and are very popularized more and more people flood in the underground as well is is going to get a shake up too and maybe it's about time for that to happen uh so hopefully better things on the horizon all around um thank you all so much for coming today and i appreciate everything that you contributed martin so uh, yeah it's been a, a fantastic panel discussion i think we've covered a lot of a lot of ground. Um, thanks so much to Lily and, and David for your and to Kayla, of course, for your amazing insights in this field. You've been working in this area for, for quite a while now. So much um, appreciated. So thank you.